Дорогие друзья и коллеги. And gentlemen, dear colleagues, good morning. We are glad to greet you here at our Gimo University. My name is Andrei Sushinsov. I am director of the Institute for International Studies, director of the Laboratory of International Trends Analysis, Gimo University. Today we are holding a fourth conference on political risks and forecasting international uncertainty. We are glad to greet our guests and conference participants. We hope that this discussion will make the next year less uncertain that it happens every year. Every year the international processes are, sp are speeding up and they sometimes uh, uh, are not in line with our focus. So we are making uh, efforts to make analytical models more viable and f certain uh, so, and to help politicians and uh, heads of analytical departments of the leading ministries and corporations to make uh, plans for the future because assessment of political risks forecasting the objective of these things is just to lighten the dark room and uh, which makes it possible to make uh, planning. I'd like to give floor to Vice Rector for Masters and in International Programs and my dear friend Andrei Baikov. He'll give a welcome address. Thank you, Andrei. Dear colleagues, if you don't mind, I'll speak English. Dear colleagues and guests, in this time of heightened uncertainty and the rupture of many stereotypes, there are exceedingly few things that are fixed and certain, that hence act as mental anchors, heartening sources of reassurance amidst the current turbulence. One of them is this conference that takes place every December in the run-up to the long stretch of much-awaited holidays, and therefore for me is always associated with the prospect of rest, plenty of comfort, food, and Christmas miracles. I extend my sincere congratulations and thanks to my dear friend and colleague Andrei Sushinsov for gathering us on the eve of the new year to reflect on, the, on what has happened over this past year, to critically assess our successes and failures to predict its developments, and to discuss how our common cause and shared commitment to using the advances in our profession can be taken even further. I would like at this point to acknowledge amongst the participants and speakers around this table the presence of our esteemed foreign friends, world-renowned specialists in applied international analysis from Armenia, Austria, Belarus, China, Germany, France, India, Iran, Italy, Kazakhstan, Syria, Turkey, Ukraine, United Kingdom. And of course I would like to express our gratitude to Bill Wolfhoff, the academic director of what we call LAMP, which is Laboratory of Applied Research of International Problems. Thanks to the grant that he executes here at Ngimo, we have the funds to organize this event. And of course I would like to thank Deborah Larson, whom I had the pleasure to admire many times at annual ISA conventions, who seems to have faced the longest flight amongst all of you, all the way from the California sun uh, sunny coast to a surprisingly warm Moscow to join us at this table. That's in all 15 countries. The international dimension and scope of the expertise that Andre and Bill have managed to provide leave no doubt that this is going to be a truly cosmopolitan discussion of the current state of affairs in the field of down-to-earth prognostications of global and regional political <coughs> events, the accuracy of which are essential to effective governance and crisis management at all levels of the international community. This year we are celebrating the 90th anniversary of one of the finest Soviet and Russian statesmen, Evgeny Primakov. Many of you, I am sure, know that he was also a brilliant scholar, full member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, who led for some years two institutes within the Academy, the Institute of Oriental Studies and the Institute of World Economy and International Relations, that now carries his name. But I think few of you know that Evgeny Primakov played the principal role in establishing and consolidating in 2010 the Division of Global Issues and International Relations within the Russian Academy of Sciences. 
It contributed enormously to the professionalization and recognition of the field of international relations in Russia as a self-sufficient area of academic inquiry, which brought together all the relevant institutes of Russian Academy of Sciences and provided for a unique platform for academic debate of specialists. He was also an alumnus of the Institute of Oriental Studies, the precursor of MGIMO, established in 1815, and which was in 1956 incorporated into Mgimo University together with its unique library collection and the student files of all its students, including that of Evgeny Maximovich. Academician Primakov returned many times to Mgimo already after he had left his high offices as director of Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service, Russia's Foreign Minister, and Russia's Prime Minister. In 2005, he, together with another Russian political theory classic, Professor Krustelov, published a manual on how to conduct situation analysis, a patented procedure of organizing in-depth situation examination for the purpose of formulating recommendations to highest ranking decision-making classes. The method Krustelov and himself, both graduates of the same class of Moscow Institute of Oriental Studies, just before he joined MGIMO, developed in the 1970s, and for which Academician Primakov was awarded state prize of the United, uh, of, the United, of the Soviet Union in 1980. In t 2005 and 2008, Academician Primakov was professor at MGIMO and introduced MGIMO students in very small groups of, after, of up to six people, including myself, to how this powerful method actually works. I am infinitely grateful to my lucky stars for this invaluable experience, and we are determined to pass it on to the next generations of our students. It is no accident that we have decided to dedicate the final panel of this conference that will be devoted to forecasting in international relations to the memory of Evgeny Primakov. In conclusion, I would like to say a few words on the substance of the questions discussed on forecasting and applied political analysis. There are those in our field who believe that social scientists ought to remain confined to the ivory tower of academia, elaborating and testing theories and accumulating knowledge. There are, however, others who believe that the duty of social scientists may not necessarily be to take on vocal stand on any topical social issue, both domestic and international, but who must use the accumulated knowledge to help inform decision-making, to offer a series of sound options based on the verified, properly processed data and ample evidence. We at MGIMO, as the university most tightly integrated into the foreign policy decision in this country, believe that our role as faculty is to equip our students with knowledge, research methodologies, and leadership competences to be able to come up with evidence-based options for decision makers, or if they find themselves in the positions of power, to exercise wise leadership, and that is to look to social science for options to make informed decisions. This is crucial for every country in the world embedded now in the global technologically connected civilization which faces common challenges of survival and finding ways of assuring common benefits and thriving for all humankind. In the dilemma of we either save the, the Earth or get ready to colonize the outer space, I do believe that the former option is the only one available to us. I again thank all of you assembled here for taking this commitment to informed decision making so seriously. And I wish you all yet another fruitful meeting. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Today we have Aydar Aganin, Deputy Director of the Foreign Policy Planning Department at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia. I'll be speaking Russian, uh, bringing more spice into discussion. <coughs> Uh, uh, <coughs> so we've got together today um, for the fourth conference on political risks and forecasting. We are going to discuss the rising risks and uncertainties. The uncertainty is becoming global at present times. So what is the ground for this uncertainty and even unpredictability, unpredictability of these processes? Looking from Moscow, we can uh, single out the systemic crisis of globalization that was uh, launched according to the American uh, plans. When we criticize globalization, 
meaning that uh, there is a rising interconnectivity between uh, the world. Actually, it's a good thing. It's an advantage. Uh, we do not mean a global uh, village. But what we are against is when we see that they try to format the global space uh, under a certain matrix. Let's, uh, uh, let me quote Kissinger. Globalization is just uh, another word that means domination of the United States. The, yes, they speak from the high rostrums that there is a growth in integration in political and economic uh, areas. But now, uh, when we are moving to the third uh, millennium uh, century, we feel that there is no honest integration. Let's look at the whole world. The world is divided into the subjects of globalization and its objects. Subjects have the superiority, exclusive rights, and objects that should be grateful uh, to accept financial systems worked out uh, in other parts of the globe and the practice of uh, constant ongoing political pressure. The same can be seen in international relations. President Putin said this summer that we are witnessing a replacement of international law by uh, some regional laws or by a law of one influential country. So that's what we see from Moscow. What we see, uh, NATO enlargement, uh, just the, under the slogan, East Europe is European Union. The deployment of anti-missile defense systems near the Russian borders attempts to uh, bring Ukraine uh, closer to Europe against Russia. And uh, it's, uh, it's true about other, uh, our, our neighbors. Lavrov uh, said yesterday, so all these attempts are quite counterproductive. Our neighbors should not face this choice, European Union or Russia. So I'm talking about the minister now, and our efforts are now directed at the following thing. So Russia is now getting more isolated from the neighbors that uh, we have been in contact for many years, and we can see the repercussions of these policies still. We can see increased collisions in the media field. You all know this. So some people are journalists, some people just do propaganda, some people are admitted to international conferences, some are not. And uh, now the foundation of international laws is being undermined and uh, everyone uh, is now functioning in the world order that uh, acts according to certain rules and not international law. So whose rules are this? Who determines the rule of the game if we're not talking about the legitimate power of institutions that we have created together? So it's not surprising that such a world order doesn't work. Global politics and economy grow more imbalanced and they are now experiencing a crisis. Jasinski offered a term called deregulation, which is a partial loss of control on social and economic spheres uh, among the Western elites. And uh, being on the brink of loss of a political control. And Jasinski explained this term by high political activity and dynamics, uh, calling it a political awakening. And uh, it is an awakening because we can see uh, that we are now uh, parting from the situation of a diverse world and going to a more uniform world uh, where we are imposed different values. 
And uh, as a theoretician of post-industrial world, Nabella said, uh, someone's history and culture preve uh, prevents us from technical progress. I quote, culture is a summary of uh, irrational things that are connected to the previous stages of development of civilizations. And uh, you know, national cultures and national economies uh, do not accept the models that are being imposed on them. It is one thing to borrow uh, technologies and best practices from somebody. I believe this is quite a positive phenomenon that we need to welcome. And another thing is just being reformatted. Every sovereign country is a unique world, is a unique culture, is a unique tradition, and you cannot just intervene and behave uh, as if you are being the main person there. That's why we see growing instability. In the 1990s, an American pol political scientist, Rosenal, who unfortunately uh, has already passed away, offered the term turbulence. So uh, uncertainty, turbulence, what did he mean by turbulence? He meant economic, social, uh, and political upheaval. And turbulence leads to growing risks uh, in foreign policies of the state. So the ideology of certain instability, the ideology of anxiety, it's a crisis of the picture of the world that the West had and that was offered the world as the only possible model after the Cold War, as, as you know, where the key element of this vision uh, was uh, the main role of only one country and the monocentric vision of the modern world that is now accepted uh, in the West. Uh, if we look at it today, it is a thing of the past, and it doesn't correspond the real state of affairs. And I believe that we are going to talk about the real state of affairs here. The global contradiction of current global development is also reflected in the fact that now there is a tougher interstate competition in different spheres, even in culture and sports even though objectively we need a totally opposite thing. We need mutually respectful actions of all the participants of international relations and mostly world powers. Many crisis phenomena form this feeling of uncertainty and anxiety and worry for international security that we're going to talk about today. And uh, this anxiety is growing, the worry is growing for all human civilization, especially taking into account uh, the um, poor state of ecology and uh, our environment. I believe that um, this is all I, w I want to say now, and I wish everyone a productive discussion. Thank you very much for this interesting contribution. And uh, it's quite an interesting position. And now I would like to uh, skip my introduction and move on straight to part one. And I want to build a bridge to this first session. And so I want to share an observation with you. And I believe this is something that unites all big uh, uh, political scientists uh, who live these days, and they connect the current state of uncertainty of international processes to the fact that now there is an erosion of the foundations of uh, the world order. Uh, and now there are centrifugal processes uh, inside the current alliances. And I believe that this period of time is uh, very difficult for multilateral organizations, uh, both in the West and uh, in Eurasia. But it is obvious that what's going on in the world in Eurasia, which is the biggest continent, uh, has not only centrifugal, but also opposite tendencies. And uh, we can see this in the relations between Russia, China, and India. And the Russian school of international relations, especially the school of applied science that is now 
a developed opinion in Russia's leading universities, um, it says that, uh, well, there are many applied research, and uh, it now shows that the center of gravity is in Eurasia. And the key task of the 21st century is to create an inclusive uh, security system and an inclusive economic system in the continent that could live without external players uh, and their intervention. And today, in order to discuss the growing role of China and India and the growing role of Russia in Eurasia, we have an opportunity to hear out the leading experts. And now I would like to give the floor to Alexei Voskresensky, the director of the MGMO Center for Integrated Sinology and Regional Projects. And he's one of the leading experts on China. And he's a researcher that has a world recognition. Thank you very much. So what time limit do I have? All right. So talking about the big Eurasian partnership between Russia, India, and China, uh, the first thing I would like to say is that there are many visions and many concepts of global, regional, and national projects. And I would probably call them uh, a very radical uh, rebalance. And the question here is to determine how this balance changes. And that's why we need to uh, look back on the past. So uh, I'm going to talk about two projects. And then I'm going to try to show you uh, what conclusions can be made um, from them. I'm not a government person, but I'm going to uh, speak Russian as well as uh, the previous speakers. Ten years ago, we published a book that's called The Big Eastern Asia. And uh, there, we formulated some main points uh, about the future of global development. And actually, this book was meant uh, for the C uh, SEO University. This was supposed to be a course, um, an educational program that would be conducted together with China. And there we had different factors uh, of the processes currently going on in East Asia. We had uh, different sections like energy politics and economics. Uh, we raised the question of uh, different leaders. We talked about China's growth. We also talked uh, about alternative types of leadership. And we also paid great attention to non-Western transformations. And we tried to uh, also talk about adjacent territories through conceptualizing macro-regionalization and trans-regionalization as uh, a non-Western type of globalization, so a milder globalization for those who have certain restrictions or limitations to take part in this process or for someone who has weak points. This book also talked about economic cooperation between Russia, China, and India, uh, the prospects and the limitation of this partnership. And uh, it was said that uh, this partnership would provide energy security, more independence in global politics, and it will give an opportunity to work out a new network of suppliers, um, including food suppliers, that it would strengthen bilateral relations and open up new opportunities to resolve old issues. And we also talked about some specific examples um, when it comes to the positive side of this trilateral relations. But the main conclusion of this book, and this is the second main point that I want to talk about, is the fact that ambitious economic partnership uh, is more important than a military strategic partnership between Russia, India, and China. And uh, this year, we have published a book that's called The Regional World Order, Transregionalism, regional integration, and regional projects across Europe and Asia. And uh, this book mentioned all the new things that happened uh, in the 10 years after our previous book. And uh, this book talks about the change of balance 
and it says that each regional organization uh, is now looking for their own balance between regionalism and trans-regionalism. And there we talk about the term uh, of regional world orders, and we're talking about the problem of contradiction between uh, national particularities and regional particularities um, and integration into the global system uh, in order not to be isolated. We have also talked about uh, the experience of the EU. Uh, we talked about differentiated integration. And we also analyzed the non-institutionalized models. We also talked about the ASEAN experience. Um, about their integration that uses quite simple methods of economic cooperation. And we also talked about the Eurasian Economic Union uh, that was built on previous economic types of a certain model. So all these things allow us to form some new theories um, regarding what we call the big Eurasian partnership. And uh, I believe that this will mostly be built on only three countries, Russia, India, and China. And um, uh, we have talked a lot with China recently. Uh, so here is what we discuss mainly. The first question is how to reinforce political stability uh, by the combination of political and economic ways. There are many projects of partnership and cooperation, and I believe that we need to analyze the differences um, and um, the points that are the same in these projects. China is now becoming one of the biggest players. And uh, the representatives of China say that China is not ready for the mechanisms of arms control. They are not ready to take part uh, in the mechanisms of strate strategic uh, mechanisms. They don't understand what is the mechanism of arms control. They are not ready to do it bilaterally. But at the same time, the representatives of China say that the main task is to involve the United States in this dialogue. And uh, one of the advantages in this change of balance is the fact that between the United States and China, there is a contradiction. But uh, China is not pictured as an enemy. They are pictured as a rival. But at the same time, we can see a consensus about, the, uh, about China and the United States. And it's a bipartisan consensus. And uh, the European Union deems China as uh, a very assertive partner. And China understands that without the European Union, they cannot uh, do the One Belt, One Road project. However, Chinese representatives say that uh, China behaves very moderately in the European Union, and uh, they can prove it. They say that there is no military presence in Central Asia. So consequently, we have a question. What are the resources and what are the limitations of this big partnership that is about to happen? Everyone understands that without integration, it is important to support the competitiveness that we have these days. Uh, there is also uh, an interesting point of view by one of the leading uh, Chinese political scientists who said that the United States uh, took 50 years to become a hegemony. It means that aside from uh, China growing, even if they can become the first economy in the world, it will take no less than 50 years to become closer to this uh, to these structural characteristics of leadership that the United States has now. But at the same time, Chinese representatives say that uh, now the US is withdrawing from some regions, and now they focus on their economic projects. And it turned out that they can negotiate without the United States in Eurasia. And uh, it turned out to be much more complicated than with the United States. So we have a question. If liberalism and multiculturalism uh, are not the ideological uh, 
programs that they need and are not the projects that form at Eurasia, what are the projects that uh, will be suitable for all countries in Eurasia? What regional order do we need? I believe that there will be different regional orders that will uh, cooperate with one another. So what regional order do we need in Eurasia? Uh, so here we're talking about legal norms, international law, uh, we're talking about informal principles, we're talking about um, the principles of peace that might be too general for today. But at the same time, today we understand very clearly that China is building a closed economic system, a closed technological and internet system. It now expands its controlled market and uh, supply chains, and they protect them with their own financial mechanisms uh, that can be reinforced uh, in a military way. So here's a question. When we're talking about big Eurasian partnership, can we say that Russia, India, and China uh, use the same mechanism? So China uh, believes that Russia and China are the two states that need to structure uh, Eurasian partnership, and they don't mention India. So how can we give a structure to all the to the military force to our ideas or for example India has a project of digital cooperation and uh, uh, so what's the conclusion? I believe that uh, I've talked about enough issues for a discussion. Okay, uh, I just have to wrap it up. So there is a competition, a rivalry between models, regional uh, uh, models uh, and, and not national states. Now it's becoming clear that this rivalry or competition cannot be uh, uh, cannot be uh, cannot go on without interconnectivity. So there is uh, there is an overlapping of these projects, and so we are witnessing cooperation through a very interesting or even uh, semi-hidden way. So the question arises: What are the specific forms and formats of this interconnectivity that uh, are being shaped? How can we? Uh, avoid conflicts. For example, uh, a new player with a new project, one uh, built, one road, has a reason. So how it should be included into the uh, general space? And uh, we can see now that we um, the, uh, cannot achieve a balance, uh, strike a balance, and that's why conflicts uh, are prevailing, but I believe that we cannot move on without this interconnectivity I'm talking about. So how can it be implemented in the Euro Eurasian space in a closer, open way? Uh, today we have uh, uh, well, we are welcoming our colleague from China, Xin Zhan, associate professor at the East China uh, Normal University. We have been uh, 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 meeting all the time with uh, Mr. Jensen, so I I can't speak uh, uh, Russian, so I'm going to much sense. But uh, Andrei already explained Russian uh, pedagogic pedagogic university that make more more sense in. In, uh, in Russian. Um, so I make, uh, uh, com make comments on two major uh, issues. One is the, the emergence of uh, different ideas, different imaginations about, about Eurasia and what's the implication for uh, policy making in the near, near future, uh, but with a focus particularly on uh, China and, and Russia. But the implication probably is broader than the two countries. And the second main point is on the institutional form, form of possible Eurasia integration with an emphasis on uh, Shanghai cooperation uh, to illustrate both its limits and the potentials for institutional form <coughs> for a, um, a possible uh, new uh, uh, greater Eurasia. The first point uh, about uh, the, the, uh, um, the recent emergence of um, multiple what I call um, uh, new imaginations of geographic imaginations of uh, Eurasia. Uh, this is really a historical moment. Uh, such kinds of uh, explosion of geographic or ge geopolitical imagination of a su such a big uh, geographic location in the world is really rare for what I know in uh, non-war 
period. Now, usually that happened after war, but in a peaceful situation, such a um, vibrant discussion of different formation of an, such a big chunk of uh, space is really unprecedented for what I know. And uh, historically, if there is some solid uh, reformulation of uh, Europe, Asia, not only Euro-Asia, but Europe, uh, Asia, is of uh, great historical significance, uh, particularly think about uh, U.S. domination in the world, its, it's underlying geographic uh, blueprint for the whole world. If uh, Europe plus Asia can find some solid foundation for um, uh, integration and co collaboration without a deep involvement of the U.S., this is really of uh, historical significance. I think that's well understood in uh, most of the regional countries, uh, China, Russia, and uh, uh, India included. But having said that, uh, among these many different re recently emerging, emerging um, geographic and geopolitical imagination about either Eurasia or bigger Eurasia, they obviously are very different uh, ideational um, uh, uh, calculation. Uh, uh, I think uh, our first speaker, Professor Wasklesinski, also referred to that. Um, so I'll focus on Russia and China, uh, build on some of the academic uh, work I'm doing with uh, some colleagues. Um, if you look at the uh, uh, more recent um, official narrative about Eurasia Economic Union and compare that with the China's official narrative about the, the so-called Belt and Road uh, Initiative. If we take these uh, two ideational bodies that, that uh, uh, set the two countries or states' imagination of Euro, Eurasia, there are obviously a, a set of uh, interesting and important differences. Um, the, the, the Belt and Road, if I call it a brie, looks at this broadly defined Europe plus Asia, and not only Euro-Asia, Europe plus Asia as an as a open, coherent, uh, uh, flat space, a non-territorial surface that's waiting to be explored by unrestricted flow of goods, services, information, population, or even all kinds of non-visible uh, uh, technology or information. E EAU predominantly look at the space as a set of territorial nation-state uh, integration. As uh, uh, widely discussed in the Chinese uh, academic community, uh, people call it uh, uh, a series of fence building. Uh, fence building. Uh, in Chinese, we call it Zhali Ba. So this is already a very different sort of uh, perception of this potentially integrated space. In the Chinese narrative about Bri, you can see cities, uh, particularly cities or city, group of cities, play a fundamental, important uh, docking uh, 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 function. Uh, builds on a series of infrastructure that, that connect these cities other, and other boundary building, boundary docking um, mechanism. Uh, Russia's Eurasian integration instead, uh, there's very little specific discussion, for example, cities or these specific hubs in the space. Rather, the EAU, uh, according to official narrative, builds much more on a broader general discussion of uh, nation, civilizational identity building. Uh, it's interesting if you look at the Chinese narrative, it's actually downplayed the civilizational core of this economic integration. The idea is actually very, very the official narrative is actually very cosmopolitan on a global level. Right? We're different in, in, in terms of our civilizational core, but it doesn't matter. We can actually co collaborate to peacefully coexist in this flat, open, open space. And that's not, exa not exactly not what uh, Russian narrative indicates. And then overall, what emerged in the Britain narrative is a, some sort of a pan-continental uh, imagination imagination of common economic uh, space, at least economic space. EAU builds on more regional uh, macro block, blocks, uh, blocks. And uh, uh, even in terms of the basic concepts of uh, integration or collaboration, uh, uh, in Chinese we call it Duijia. In Russia there are several <coughs> different words, uh, Saplizhenia, uh, um, and uh, several other words. Even if you look at these words, there seem to be a underlying difference in the, in the uh, underlying connotation of these words. Uh, the Chinese words indicate some sort of integration in this format. Uh, this format. Uh, Supplejenia sub more indicates a parallel, parallel of two, two sets of institutions or practices. Right? So they're both integration, but integration very, with very different, uh, very different con specific connotations. Uh, I know this may be a little bit abstract or theoretical, but I think it's co-specific policy connotations too. 
And uh, uh, the discussion so far focuses on Russia-China contrast, but I, th I think uh, actually I'm doing that. You can, you can apply the, the same sets of comparison uh, from a, a, a critical geography to other major, major uh, players or agencies in this area, uh, potentially India, uh, Iran, Turkey, Kazakhstan, uh, the list can go on. So how to handle this underlying fundamental difference in these imagined different imagination about Euro-Asia. This is a serious uh, policy a challenge um, uh, for policymakers. Um, does difference mean there will be more conflict that will become a difference, become a barrier for collaboration? Or in other way around, the difference actually means there are more uh, a potential of collaboration. This is also a big question. Can I get one minute? The second point is about institutional format. Uh, again, to follow the logic I just lay out, uh, the Chinese version of Brie, uh, especially in the land route, does so far doesn't uh, specifically demand for a uh, organizational format. Uh, it's supposed to be an open, uh, inclusive, a flat uh, space. Uh, but Russia, as well as some other agencies in the Euro-Asian Euro uh, integration plan, look for, uh, uh, insist on a very specific specific concrete institutional foundation. Then the SCO in that sense become a po possible ready-made uh, um, template or institutional form for, uh, as an institutional foundation for a potential integrated Euro big Eurasia space. But of course, recently, we have seen um, uh, uh, probably more differences and conflicts in, in terms of its role, SCO's potential role for this, this space, particularly after India become an official member. Right? Um, uh, the, 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 in the Chinese community, uh, policy community, there was actually big regret that uh, com sort of complaining the, the, the SCO agenda, particularly in, in terms of organizational expansion, somehow is dominated by the Russian, Russian agenda, um, and particularly include, uh, include uh, India as a new member. And the same thing goes for potential uh, inclusion of Iran into SCO, uh, which is regarded as mostly a Russian agenda. Uh, and there is concern that maybe a Russian agenda become too dominant again uh, in the next round of expansion. And uh, the overall assessment of uh, India and Pakistan's uh, integrate, uh, um, uh, 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 entry into WTO and uh, uh, SCO as a new official member is generally on the p p pessimistic side. Uh, it seems that SCO has increasingly become a shell, shell for for uh, uh, all kinds of official doc documents and announcements without beyond a very limited, uh, effective, but a very effective collaboration among the original members in terms of uh, uh, combat against, against terrorism. There's really not much of substantial beyond that. Right? So how to handle this uh, reformed SEO format potentially for a, a better uh, organized, better integrated uh, big, uh, great Eurasia space. This is also another uh, key issue on the table of policymakers. So I'll stop here. Maybe we can expand yes. during the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Today, we can greet Timofey Bordachev, academic supervisor at the Center for Comprehensive European and International St Studies, High School of Economi Economics. He is one of the co authors of this term, interconnectivity. He is uh, head of one of the leading centers. And uh, it's a center that sometimes come up with uh, metaphors describing the development of international relations. I'd like to stress that this center is involved in applying sciences. And for example, uh, Timofey Bordachev uh, came up with a, a metaphor of uh, erosion of international order. It sounds in Russian uh, a little bit different. Asipania means that uh, uh, it's still in place, but it's not under, uh, uh, it's, uh, there is no focus on it, but uh, still it's, uh, it's being eroded and it uh, uh, to, uh, uh, will be in ruins. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here today. I hope that my brief comments will add to our discussion and to our analysis. So, so if you talked about this erosion and uh, you, you talked about this big uh, project one road one belt so it's a good very good example that strategically 
uh, cultures of various states and nations are fluid. They are subject to changes, and it depends on the state to think rationally. I remember very well as five years ago in spring uh, 2015, uh, the leading uh, sinologists uh, uh, tried to convince me that China would never be ready for cooperation uh, within the Shanghai organization because they told me that China is ready to develop bilateral cooperation and only bilateral cooperation. And I, I remember my answer. I said, I hope that the Chinese leaders understand much better the interests of China than our leading sinologists, uh, our leading uh, researchers. And you see our uh, leaders of both countries uh, signed their uh, corresponding accords and now uh, we are developing our cooperation within the framework of this big organization. And so it's an alternative to chaos that dominates interna in international relations now. So you see, uh, uh, our conference uh, uh, title is International Uncertainty. So it focuses on risks and uncertainties. Of course, we can prove that it's, uh, these uncertainties are being um, are very active now uh, because we are uncertain about the role and uh, fate of uh, our traditional international organizations. Of course, it's a factor of uncertainty. But on the other hand, we can vis witness a lot of more certainty than even 15 years ago. We can be more certain about policy pers policies pursued by big powers with regards to each other. For example, the United States policy is quite certain and its policy towards Russia and China, they are quite, uh, they are just adverse. And for us, it's, uh, it's better to understand than to uh, feel this uncertainty. And uh, the relations between Russia and China are also quite certain. They are friendly. And uh, when we talk about India, uh, again, we can say that India's policy is quite certain with regards to Russia and China because they are friendly. So, of course, there are some disputes, but it's a normal practice because I even in cooperation there are some disputes may arise. So the relations between India, China, Russia and uh, smaller players we can say that this environment is quite friendly and it's a very good thing for us. So we see that the, there is a certainty of intent and it's, it uh, makes chaos uh, around us uh, uh, less, uh, uh, less significant. Remember the end of the Cold War. Many people believed that the United States and their allies, its allies could become the leaders of the world, global leaders. Both Russia and China wanted it, and Europe supported this idea, but our American friends did not cope with the, the, that great task. And now we have to make adjustments and to improve the international situation because the United States uh, didn't manage to become a, a hegemon, but uh, a hegemon that would treat everybody fairly, honestly, and favorably. Unfortunately, it didn't happen, but, uh, but uh, so that's the situation today. Today, the strategic cultures in all cases are coming through very serious changes and or they need these 
changes and adjustments while witnessing really fantastic processes and the U.S. domestic policy that would lead to the U.S. strategic culture and uh, strategic uh, foreign policy. In 15, 20 years, we'll see more adequate uh, colleagues, uh, uh, more adequate in terms of international reality. As they will understand that cooperation f uh, co and competition are just normal things, but if uh, we talk about competition, it does not meet, mean uh, unconditional uh, hegemony and dominance. So they will have China will have to adapt its strategic culture. Of course, our Chinese friends uh, believe in Confucian and, and Marx, and they see uh, the world in a more linear shapes. And for example, we uh, living in Russia, as uh, they believe that people uh, that the humanity can uh, move towards our uh, bright future, and we in Europe understand that it's not possible. So China is learning, is uh, learning, and uh, uh, now it understands the importance of multilateral cooperation. Uh, uh, of course, China has huge potential in terms of human resources, territory, and uh, economy, and uh, the uh, limiting factor, actually it's a limiting factor. You need to learn to save resources and to create a favorable international environment around China and uh, uh, globally. Uh, uh, Russia wants small and middle-sized states to treat China better because they don't now. And now we want peace and we don't want the United States to play a destructive role. And for need, we need these states to treat China well. And for this, China needs to change their behavior. They need to become a power that plays multilateral games. And I believe that uh, Xi Jinping understands that really well. And uh, I was witnessing his participation in many international national forums when uh, he was speaking as the leaders uh, of those states that are not equal to them. And uh, he was present in plenary sessions as well. And uh, they talked not only to Russia, but also to small and middle-sized states. And of course, uh, the Russian culture is changing too. And uh, for Russia, one of the limitations is its military power and the tradition to provide its security through using uh, force or threatening use of force. But now I can see an indicator that Russia is learning, and now Russia is trying to provide security not through um, coercive dominance, but through creating a joint space. Uh, for example, the Eurasian uh, Economic Union or the big Eurasian partnership are the best examples of this. As for the biggest problems in transforming its culture, um, it concerns our European friends that are uh, the birthplace of uh, civilization. You know, Machiavelli wasn't born in a Russian town. Uh, this is all a legacy of Europe. And our European friends believe that in international relation, there is a constant fight. The question is, what are the rules of this fight? And uh, how can these rules help us avoid a conflict? So here I'm going to end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your brilliant contribution. Uh, you instill some optimism to us when you say that the U.S. behavior would stabilize in the nearest 15 or 20 years. Of course, we know that Machiavelli wasn't born in Russia. But uh, anyway, I believe his ideas are implemented very well in uh, Russia. Uh, and now I would like to use these observations as a bridge uh, to the speeches of, from our colleagues of India. Uh, today, Sanjay Eshpande is with us. He's the director of the Center for Eurasian Studies in the University of Mumbai. And I would like our colleagues to share about what they think of Eurasian processes. Uh, what does India think about them? It's uh, back to here in Yemgimo once again. After a gap of four years, when I participated in BRICS conference here in uh, 
in this university. Uh, once again, I feel that uh, this country, this uh, city is my second home uh, because I spent nearly 13 years in this city and this is my fourth visit in this year. So, uh, uh, very happy. And uh, thanks to you both and MGMO, my dear friend Sergey and others for uh, your gracious invitation to participate <coughs> in this uh, uh, August gathering and present my views uh, in front of uh, uh, you and others, yes. Uh, I will talk on uh, this, uh, how India-Russia-China triangle will strengthen Eurasian Union, uh, in, uh, Eurasian Union, and second, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. As uh, we know, disintegration of the Soviet Union attracted many state and non-state actors uh, in Eurasia. And at that time, uh, Russia adopted policy, uh, foreign policy of Atlanticism and it uh, towards the West just to carry out economic and political reforms. I would say better so-called political and economic reforms in the 1990s. Uh, but at, uh, Andrei Baikov rightly said that it was Andrei Primakov who turned and shifted the policy from Atlantism to Eurasianism in late 90s, uh, particularly, but uh, I would uh, prefer give uh, the credit to, of course, uh, the current president, uh, Vladimir Putin. And Putin has uh, transformed this language as the policy of Eurasianism uh, in a new uh, concept. And it has always been associated with power in Asia. Uh, in other words, Russia just could play a role of great Asian power. Uh, in this uh, connection, that's uh, better. I, I would go directly to uh, this one. Uh, Primakov advocated the idea of Russia, India, China triangle in late 98 in Delhi. And this strategic triangle uh, was actually was, uh, was a turning point in the history of international relations. But what we feel in India, does this triangle, however, uh, remain questionable? And development of strategic triangle would be unrealistic due to mutual suspicion between India and China. But there are some positive points in the last several years. Our uh, new government had some informal meeting with the Chinese president and, uh, and of course, with the Russian president. Uh, so in that... Uh, uh, in that connection, what we see that uh, everyone knows India and Russia are the natural partners. Uh, India and Russia are uh, natural partners. Uh, so, uh, how these three countries will play an important role in Eurasia? As the three largest countries on the Eurasian landmass with substantial, uh, substantial regional influence, this Russia, India, China, Triangle. Uh, is not only a major reformer but in international system, but it can uh, it is also a key stakeholder in maintaining peace and stability in future Eurasia. Uh, how? That's, uh, this coordination represents a non-ideological pattern of major power cooperation on regional security. The all, all these three countries differ in political culture and values, but Dealing with foreign affairs, they share a wide range of common interests. So close cooperation among these countries will serve a good example for non-ideological strategic cooperation among major powers of the world. They, uh, this uh, triangle is not guided by a unified ideology. Instead, it promotes greater multipolarity and democratization of international relations. Second, uh, India, Russia, China is hoping to introduce a new a template for regional uh, cooperation in various fields based, based on different models. Uh, this uh, triangle shows a new approach of major power cooperation on silent regional affairs, particularly in Eurasia. The practical development of these, uh, uh, of these three uh, countries, uh, bilateral ties, contributes the overall place of uh, overall peace and stability in Eurasia. They not only set up a new pattern of regional political and economic cooperation, but also uh, 
a viable pathway towards building a new Asia Pacific and Eurasian security. The next third one, this, this triangle can serve as a core of collective Eurasian platform to address the maritime security pressures in uh, Asia Pacific. Thus, a stronger RIC will uh, exert a major impact on the regional security landscape. Uh, fourth one, the Eurasian region has witnessed increasing challenges in both traditional and non-traditional security realms. In this context, closer, what I feel, that's, I argue that, closer RIC cooperation has, uh, will become uh, very important and that will help to address all these challenges. Uh, and lastly in that, that uh, this uh, India, uh, Russia-India-China cooperation may increase the power of discourse for emerging countries. They can build a new Asia-Pacific security architecture and many of their best practices and mechanism for promoting such an architecture that can be employed for uh, effective global governance in the future. So, greater coordination among all, uh, 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 this, all these three countries will greatly influence the future uh, trajectory of uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization also. This, uh, how, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, India, Russia, China are working in various platforms. Uh, the, of course, this India, Russia, China, <coughs> then Shang, uh, SCO, then BRICS, and other multinational organizations. The significance of SCO cannot be underestimated because of the presence of large territorial and economic powers like Russia, China, and of course India. You rightly said that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, entry of India into SCO will strengthen this, uh, this organization. Yes, of course. Uh, and the, geo the geographical and strategic space which the SEO straddles is of critical importance for India. India's security, uh, geopolitical, strategic and economic interests are closely interlinked with developments in Eurasian region. The, the ever-present and expanding challenges of terrorism, radicalism and instability pose a, great, a, a grave threat to the sovereignty uh, sovereignty and integrity, not only of India, but also of other states uh, of Eurasia, uh, Eurasian region. So, Russia, India, China emphasis that the SCO's important contribution to security lies in, in its ability to address a variety of more local security threats, including that what I said, the terrorism and drug trafficking and uh, the situation in and around uh, Afghanistan. So, uh, uh, entry of Pakistan also is a very positive point in that sense. In this context, Russia increasingly turned uh, to the SEO as a mechanism for institutionalizing a foreign presence in Afghanistan along with NATO forces. And in that connection, China has advocated that SEO should play a very vital role in this region. Uh, and so therefore, this will surely help to stabilize uh, the situation, political situation in India's north and northeast area. Just I will conclude now. That's, so what uh, 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 in that? So uh, uh, therefore, uh, India, Russia, and China should work together, actively together, in regional and global organization and they are working, and surely this uh, triangle will uh, form a formidable force in the world uh, in the near future. Thank you very much. So, this uh, <laughs> thesis that Russia is a great Asian country is quite fresh, and it's really nice to hear it from our Indian colleagues. And, and you know, this Russian foreign policy is uh, making this focus in reality. We have a great luck today. Uh, we have today Mandana Tishriya, professor at Alamed Tabata, Tabatabai University. Uh, we have been cooperating together for a long time, and 
uh, our Valdai Club has published uh, a paper on the transportation corridors. Uh, one of the authors is Mandana Tishara. So it's very interesting to listen to an uh, Iranian perspective. It's both an honor and a pleasure for me to participate in this high STEM conference, and I would like to appreciate M. Gimo's initiative to gather us here to discuss about different uh, issues in regional and international level. Uh, it's a fact that in the past decades, political units, while accepting globalization of some patterns in the international arena, they also have tried to redefine their interests and identities in the regional framework next to their neighboring countries. Therefore, theories of regionalism that had a place among theories of international relations in the 1960s and 70s rushed up the steps in redefining their basic concepts from 1990s and new approaches emerged in the neo-regionalism framework. In today's world, neo-regionalism has provided an appropriate ground for forming various layers of regional cooperation based on two elements of thematic openness and geographical flexibility, and sometimes claims to have provided the foundation of a new kind of cooperation at the international level. It's also possible to define a new sphere of cooperation between countries that, according to classical definitions of the regions, we saw them in different regions of the world, and according to the new definition of the concept of the region, we can do our part to build a new region called the Eurasian region. Based on the classical theories of regionalism, since the countries cannot hold different places in every time due to the fact that they are dependent on the geographical areas where they have come into existence, therefore they don't have the option to join various regional arrangements. However, in the modern world order, the world has been globally regional rather than moving toward unipolar or multipolarism. And although powerful political units have their own rules and particular functions, regional actors have also found a stage to show themselves. In fact, it's expected that cultural integration between the units in a region could expand economic cooperation and decrease the political tensions. The European Union and ASEAN are two good examples of defining common identities and values in a way to increase collective interest in different fields. This pragmatic approach to cooperation for achieving collective security and providing interest for regional actors from convergence has been a first step towards regionalism as a bridge between two study levels of micro and macro, <coughs> I mean the political units and international structures. This new kind of regionalism has constructed identities and norms within the framework of institution building and have considered being a new political discourse in the international arena. In this new discourse, sometimes multiple identities have been defined in a geographical area and ha have overlapped each other. Subsequently, several layers of regionalism could be formed simultaneously with different functions, and each country defines its regional relations according to its needs and interests in one or more layers. Consequently, a region is what we perceive, not necessarily what is defined on the map. Therefore, although the geography is a still an important factor, this element has become more flexible and can be portrayed based on the needs, identities, and interests of a country each time. One of the functions of neo-regional cooperation is providing security based on emphasizing on common cultural models. Alexander Wendt, the author of the Social Theory of International Politics, says, 
identities are the basis of interest. From this perspective, we can say that cultural values are the basis of identities, and as the common interests can increase cooperation between the states, <coughs> redefining common cultural values can decrease the animosities and security and stability will be expanded. As a result, culture-based security is the most important production of the neo-regionalism approach. Iran and a number of Central Asian countries along with South Asian as well as Caucasian countries, although today are geopolitically placed in separate regions, they historically share a common civilization and have mostly similar elements of identity and culture. Although the political boundaries and the emphasis on nationalist elements have caused that, that people in these countries belong themselves to area rather than their neighboring regions, their common culture as an important identity element in many fields ties these lands to each other as well as to their other neighboring countries such as India, Russia, and China. China. Along with this, the need for economic growth and progress has uh, stimulated these countries into boosting trade among their countries, neighboring regions, as well as the other parts <coughs> of the world. Since security in the modern world is cross-boundary and is not limited to a specific ter territory to achieve economic dynamism and political and social stability, the countries located in this region also have no choice but to work together. These collaborations in the current era are accomplished with two goals. First, reducing tensions among the states of this geographical area. Second, establishing new conventions to confront common threats. This set of countries today has to work together at least in three spheres of culture, economy, and security to promote their national interests and collective interests. Cultural similarities and the existence of common cultural elements among people of this broad geographical area have been contributing to shaping of common identities from a long time ago. Today, the revival of these common identities can not only help the cultural convergence of people residing in these regions, but it can also form the fundamentals of stability or what can be called culture-based security. Apart from cultural aspects, the Iran's potentiality to expand connectivity in the Eurasia is another aspect of the role this country can play in the region. The, the three maps are, are designed to represent international railways, highways, and ports of Iran, telling how these roads, ports, and ports connect to other countries in the Eurasian region. In the railways map, can, as can be seen, the routes are divided into the main east west and north-south routes. On the east-west route, the roads <coughs> connect the Saraksa station on the Iranian-Turkmen border to the Razi border terminal located between Iran and Turkey. The route then continues to Istanbul and joins the European lines. The other two branches of this route include the Herat Mashhad Railway, which is undergoing its final stage of construction and is going to link Afghanistan to this broad railway route. The Gorgon in Cheburun Railway is also opening a new way to connecting Central Asia, Iran, and Turkey. On the other hand, south-north route, on the one hand, uh, there is the Bandar Abbas Tehran Railway. Bandar Abbas is currently the most important commercial port in Iran. Through this route, the South and East Asian countries connect to the Iran Turkey Europe Railway. The next part of the same route, passing through Tehran Ghazvin Rashtastara to join the Caucasus, is going to be finalized. This route will continue up to St. Petersburg. In the highway map, also, the main highways connecting Iran to other highways are located in the neighboring countries. Iran is among the few countries sharing land and sea borders with as much as 15 different countries. Highways are among the major routes connecting Iran to its neighbors, which are mostly outstanding states along the Eurasian region. Finally, in the ports map, as can be seen, Iran enjoys important and strategic ports in the Persian Gulf and the Caspian. 
these ports are connected through land and railways, virtually connecting the two main energy hubs in the world. The Iranian ports around the Persian Gulf have been trading hubs for the Korean, Malay, Chinese, Indian, and Arab merchants since hundreds of years ago. Today, the Chabahar <coughs> port, enjoying access to Afghanistan and Central Asia, has contributed to the business partnership between India and these states. Bandar Abbas is also a crucial point located on the north-south corridor connecting Russia, Iran, and India. Moreover, owing to its vicinity, the strategic city of Basra in Iraq, Khorramshahr port has always been considered an important commercial point in the north, northernmost part of the Persian Gulf mm -hmm. and the gateway to the West Asia. Through Basra, it connects to Iraqi Kurdistan and then to Syria, Turkey, and the Mediterranean region. Mandana, can you have one? Yeah. Yeah. On the whole, it can be said that the two elements of culture and connectivity have bestowed Iran a special status since a long time ago, thereby adding to the importance importance of Iran's geocultural and geoeconomic potentials and putting this country in a position of partnership and cooperation with other powerful Asian states for the establishment of a new continental structure and an international multipolar system. Under these circumstances, on the one hand, a focus on applying cu cultural diplomacy and formation of a new trend called cultural Eurasia is very useful and necessary for promoting economic and political cooperation. On the other hand, increasing investments, connectivity, infrastructures can also be of particular imp impact for the flourishing of economic collaborations. There is no doubt that Iran can be a perfect match for its Asian partners in both these areas. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Заключительным комментарием, выступлением в рамках нашей... Just a conclusion. Today we have an expert Shuaib Hub from uh, Mumbai. For international program, MGMO University, Professor Andrei Sushenstov, Director, International Inst uh, Studies Institute, MGMO University. I thank all of you for giving me this opportunity and inviting me for this uh, presentation for this important conference. And of course, not to forget uh, Nikita Nekludev, who acted as a north-south bridge in this program by connecting all of us. So I thank all of you. And the title of my presentation is "An Emerging Geopolitical View of Eurasia and RIC." Moscow is an element, as an element of new geopolitical construct. In Russia's foreign policy, the year 2014 proved to be a turning point. It was then that Moscow began moving away from its traditional focus on Europe and the Atlantic with secondary attention to the borders of former Soviet territory. The Ukraine crisis served the two concepts that guided Russian foreign policy since the disintegration of the Soviet Union integration into the wider West and reintegration of the former republics with Russia. The emerging trend at present is not so much as a, a Russian pivot to Asia, or more precisely to China, as many commentators highlighted immediately following the Ukraine crisis, but rather a view where Moscow serves as the central element of a new geopolitical construct, particularly in Eurasia. While Russia repositions itself as a stand-alone power in the north-central portion of the world's largest continent, its leaders are seeking to create a distinct national enti entity amid a vast and highly diverse neighborhood. The country's new geopolitical framework is being referred to as Greater Eurasia. The transatlantic security order intended as a framework for bringing unity, security and stability to all of Europe, including Russia, is seen by its security establishment as the principal challenge to its security and stability intended to exploit its many vulnerabilities. This assessment of Western motives and actions resulting from them has endured with remarkable consistency in the Russian national security narrative since the early de earliest days of the post-Soviet Russian state to the present. The combination of Russia's insecurity and the West's hostility to it has been the principal driver of Russian security policy. The rejection of expansion by NATO and the European Union into countries viewed by Russian policymakers as within their sphere of privileged interests. Coupled with the fear of the Western security and political order approaching Russia's border was the key motivator behind the war with Georgia and the undeclared war against Ukraine. 
This underlying Russian worldview is unlikely to change in the foreseeable future. Energy factor in Russia's strategy and in the Eurasian region. Russia holds the world's largest proven reserves of natural gas and continually alternates with Saudi Arabia as the top oil producer. The country supplies a third of Europe's oil and natural gas and is starting to export more to the energy-hungry East Asian markets. The energy factor is far more than a commercial asset for Moscow. It has been one of the pillars of Russia's stabilization and increasing strength for more than a century. The Kremlin has designated energy security as the prime issue for Russia's national security, especially since recent changes in global and domestic trends have cast doubts on energy sector's continuing strength. The collapse of communism in Europe and the former Soviet Union has transformed world geopolitics and energy map. The previously little-known vast territory of Eurasia is forcefully entering the global scene on many fronts in which its energy resources and associated problems that crop up figure prominently. This region, the boundaries of which is difficult to draw precisely and compass more than twice the territory of the Middle East and compels the world to rethink the traditional views of its security, political and economic significance. Its power structures and the consequences that current changes portend for the world energy prospects. The long-term world energy picture is difficult to draw if one ignores this large energy-rich territory and the strategic challenges that it possesses to the Western world. Russia, China and emerging geoeconomics in Eurasia. Russia's influence on its former Soviet neighbors and Moscow's strategic alliance with Beijing in pursuit of a multipolar world form the two main pillars upon which Putin's grand strategy rests. All other aspects of its foreign policy behavior can be traced back to this dual-pronged grand strategy. The last several years has been observed as the emergence of a geoeconomic center in Eurasia amid the ongoing new Cold War. Emerging around Russia and China, it is not just a defensive alliance, but rather a new center of development aiming to become an alternative to the Euro-Atlantic one. The partnership or community of Greater Eurasia is first of all a conceptual framework that sets the direction for interaction among states on the continent. It should be committed to promoting joint economic, political and cultural revival and development of dozens of Eurasian countries backward oppressed in the past and turning Eurasia into the global economic and political center. India's quest in Eurasia. New Delhi's quest for free trade and enhanced economic growth calls for rapid Eurasian connectivity, the increasing relevance of Southeast Asia as both an important and ex as both an as both an import and export hub persists as does the imperative for reliable land routes into Central Asia, Russia and the European Union to circumvent frozen relations with Islamabad are among many strategy initiatives that may impact India's economic prospects in the next decade. Today Russia and India are bound by two key areas of cooperation. Energy inflows from Russia to India, including nuclear energy, technology, and oil exports, and the lucrative defense trade. In June 2017, Russia announced the establishment of an energy bridge in in intended to enhance bilateral cooperation in nuclear, hydrocarbon, natural gas, and other renewables. Russia has also proposed a Russia-Pakistan-India natural gas pipeline and a $25 billion Russia-India pipeline that could pass through Central Asia, Iran, and Pakistan into Western India. The stalled Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, TAPI pipeline is also attracting new interest. These initiatives would show cause maturity on the part of New Delhi, both in discarding geopolitical differences with Islamabad and Beijing, and in managing Washington's expectation to ensure India's long-term energy and defense imperatives. A recent free trade agreement between India and the Eurasian Economic Union is noteworthy. It is estimated to increase bilateral trade by more than 18%, with trade volumes expected to balloon dramatically to $30 billion by 2025. These are significant steps for India-Eurasia connectivity prospects, institutionalizing India's economic relations with both Russia and the greater Central Asian economic area. While Moscow's deepening partnerships with Islamabad and Beijing worry India, both have shared interests in ensuring a more, a more prosperous and stable Eurasia. India is working alongside Moscow in initiatives across the continent, these range from the transport corridors, particularly the long-delayed international north-south transport corridor, to regional organizations such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which India was admitted into in 2017 with Moscow's support. RIC and the emerging geopolitical realities. Russia, India, China, RIC as a strategic grouping first took shape in the late 1990s under the leadership of Yevgeny Primakov as a counterbalance to the Western Alliance. The group was founded on the basis of ending its subservient foreign policy guided by the United States, and renewing old ties with India and fostering the newly discovered friendship with China. Prospects of relations between the three countries in the new, in the 21st, uh, new, 
in the 21st century certainly imply coordinate actions taken in response to the challenges of the new century. There is a need to coordinate the actions because with the advent of the new century, the international environment in which these three states play the part of sovereign actors has become more intricate and complicated. The commonality of the key national interests and the long-term friendly relations in the field of economy, culture, science and technology create a real possibility for few cooperation between three great Eurasian powers. There are many issues on which China, Russia and India can cooperate and coordinate. The three nations share wide-ranging interests on many major international issues. All of them are committed to, a build, committed to build a just and fair new international political and economic order. On the negative side, there are issues that need to be taken into consideration. Russia, India and China, the incentives for their cooperation is basically exogenous. Their different economic structures are yet to be linked by value and industrial uh, chains through division of labor and the separate development paths lead to diverging perceptions of Western theories and practices. Conclusion, at the end of the first quarter century, after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, Russia's sense of vulnerability and inferiority vis -vis West is the long-standing deep and, and deep, and it is surrounded by a vast, diverse and turbulent region with multitude of potential crises. Both China and Russia have turned their attention to Eurasia and launched elaborative initiatives to expand their influence and reaffirm their primacy. International observers see the continent emerging once again as a potential contested zone. Development of the trilateral relationship is not going to affect their respective relationship with the US, rather strengthening their position to deal with the United States. In the long term, it is confidence between these three powers that will allow them to play a larger role in world politics and the process build more balanced world order. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear friends and colleagues, uh, we're very good with sticking to the time limit, and uh, uh, I don't want to prevent you from going to that coffee break, and uh, I suggest doing the Q&A session uh, during the coffee break in a very comfortable format. I know that we have questions for discussion, and so once again, we are meeting for session number two, that's called New Eurasia on the Course of Consolidation at 11.45.